All right, everyone, we're going to get started here and just let people uh, join as they can. But thank you all for joining us today for this offshore wind uh, webinar. Um, I'm excited to announce Kristen Hitzloff. She's our Marine Conservation Program Director here at the Environmental Defense Center. And I'm the Assistant Director. I'll just be helping facilitate. Um, so we have a, a 20 to 25 minute presentation here by Kristen and then we'll follow up with uh, Q&A at the end. As you can see in the menu bar, there's the Q&A functionality. Feel free to put um, questions in there as they come up and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, and of course, uh, her email will be available at the end and you can follow up with her if you have any further questions that we were not able to get to. I do want to mention this is recorded today um, and we will follow up with a recording um, in the, the next two or three days to get you all uh, that if you want to share it or reference it at any point in time. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Kristen. Great. Thank you, Betsy. It is so great to see so many familiar uh, names here today and it shows how engaged our community is. Um, so thank you, as Betsy said, for sharing your lunch break with us to learn about this really what I consider very interesting topic of offshore wind on the Central Coast. So um, first, this is the first webinar of the Environmental Defense Center, or as I will refer to us as EDC throughout this webinar, has done on this issue. So we are going to keep it very high level. We may have future webinars on specific projects or issues as they relate to offshore wind, if that is something our members, you all, are interested in. But for today, it's, it's meant to be very high level and as an introduction to offshore wind and what potential projects may mean for the Central Coast specifically. So before we dive in, as I said, high level, I'm going to describe what offshore wind even is. So offshore wind are wind projects or commonly referred to as wind farms that are in the ocean off our coast. So when we talk about projects coming online in California, we are talking about the first offshore wind projects on the West Coast. This is new. We are specifically considering floating offshore wind, which is very new technology. So in this webinar, I'm going to introduce you to what offshore wind may look like off the California coast, a little bit of background on why EDC is involved, the environmental issues we're looking at, and proposed projects. Okay, so to kick us off, what does offshore wind look like off the California coast? While there may be many offshore wind projects already developed globally, you may have heard of some, you may have seen pictures, you may be thinking this is old news, why is this new to us? Um, as I mentioned, this is new to California and to the west coast of the United States. And most of the wind projects currently in operation are in really shallow water. This means they look more like the turbines on the left of this picture, which are physically embedded into the ground. And in California, the continental shelf drops off quite rapidly, so any offshore wind development will be in deeper water. And because of that fact, we are talking about floating wind, which is very new technology. The first floating wind farm began operating in 2017 in Scotland, so it's only been around for a few years. That wind farm is in about 120 meters of water, and off the California coast, we are considering projects in depths up to 3,000 feet. So again, new technology, on the national or on the global scale, and even going to be even more interesting and, and deeper waters off the California coast. So new. <laughs> As you can see in the photo on the right hand side, the floating wind is connected via an array of cables that are anchoring the turbines in place, as opposed to being physically embedded into the ground like the shallower um, turbines. So these may be some of the largest turbines ever put online. So potentially bigger than anything that is currently in existence. Some estimates paint these turbines as greater than 700 feet tall, and we're talking about blades that may be more than 100 meter in length. So imagine a football field length <laughs> turbine blade. Um, these, the ones that we're talking about in Morro Bay currently, and this could change as technology is rapidly developing, are about 10 to 12 megawatts. And I know that may mean absolutely nothing to some people on this webinar. So an estimate from General Electric for a 14 megawatt turbine, so pretty close, is that one rotation of that, of that turbine could power one household for two days. So this is a lot of power we're talking about. And because this is a new technology, as I've mentioned over and over again, and it's in a new location, there are a lot of unknowns. So when I talk about this issue and say, we don't know yet, or, or we aren't sure about this, it's the greater we. It's not just EDC. It is 
it is everyone working on this issue. There are a lot of questions that industry, independent researchers, and government agencies are still trying to answer about floating offshore wind in California. And that is why EDC is working on this issue, is to make sure we account for as many possible impacts as we can and support robust planning to avoid as many negative environmental and community impacts as possible. So next, I just want to paint a broad brushstroke on the reality of our current situation in the climate change and, and the bigger why of why EDC is working on this issue. So since our inception more than 40 years ago, EDC has been working to stop offshore oil drilling to both prevent localized impacts from operations and oil spills and to reduce climate impacts. We want to keep fossil fuels in the ground. That is the only way to help solve this climate crisis. As an organization, we recognize that climate change has already begun to reshape our coastline. It has had negative impacts on our kelp forests. It has threatened our communities with fire and flooding events. And we've only just begun to see the impacts. We know that all of our conservation efforts will be for nothing if we do not tackle the climate crisis. So with that, we join our communities, our state, and luckily under the Biden administration, our nation in supporting really aggressive renewable energy goals. And renewable energy is going to come from a wide variety of sources, including everything from rooftop solar to large wind projects. And every industrial or large scale project will come with environmental impacts and trade offs, whether we're talking about big solar projects in the desert or 700 foot tall wind turbines 20 miles offshore. So EDC's position in all of this is that we support renewable energy but we maintain our role as environmental advocates to ensure that localized impacts to species and other user groups are avoided when possible. We believe that this can be accomplished by careful planning and siting of renewable projects and siting meaning where they actually end up. And when it comes to offshore wind, we've been pushing for that since 2016. We got involved early to support a really smooth transition to renewable energy, well, that's the goal at least, by working with elected representatives, the industry, and our partners in the environmental community to create paths forward for offshore wind. So now we can kind of dig into the fun part or the, the hard part, which are the environmental considerations and really what our main reason for involvement is, which is to ensure the impacts to the environment are avoided, minimized, and when that's not possible, mitigated for. So what are these environmental impacts? I'll start with collisions because this is something that probably many people are aware of with wind projects on land. And it's simply that birds and bats actually collide with the blades of these turbines. So how do we deal with this issue? Um, first and foremost, we need to prioritize the avoidance of areas with high abundance of birds and bats. Even our partners at the Audubon Society who are focused on avian species support offshore wind development because they also see the existential crisis we are facing with climate change. But like us, they agree, we have to develop these projects carefully. And they're just one of many partners that we're working with on this issue. So what happens if we can't completely avoid interactions with birds? We need to build in requirements for the wind companies to monitor so we can understand the impacts that wind farms have on avian populations and adapt operations as necessary. So that brings us to entanglement, which we often refer to when it comes to offshore wind as secondary entanglement. You saw on the on a couple of slides ago that there's cables that will be holding these turbines in, in place. We often call these um, cable arrays, though I think they're going to look much more like giant anchor chains. Um, someone described this array of cables to me as a web underwater, and that has been a really great visual for me. And as you can imagine, things can get caught in webs. So derelict or what we sometimes call ghost fishing nets and lines, just fishing nets that are kind of released from where they were meant to be and are floating around the ocean, they may get tangled on these cables and then animals may get caught in that. So entanglement can impact all types of species. And we're primarily concerned with marine mammals and sea turtles. The Central Coast is, as many of you likely know from all the work we've done on ship strikes and other marine mammal issues, the Central Coast is um, home to a variety of endangered and threatened whales. And we really wanna ensure that these wind farms do not negatively impact their recovering populations. And so that brings me to noise, another issue that, that can heavily impact marine mammals. The shallow projects that I described earlier that physically drive these structures into the sea floor have really loud impacts from what is called that pile driving. And that can have significant impacts to marine mammals. Luckily, we are told that these floating wind um, technology doesn't have that same impact since the method of attaching these structures to the seafloor is different. 
So there's less construction noise, but there will still be noise impacts from the construction and normal operations. So this can also affect marine mammals, fishes, and other species. It can also lead to potential displacement, um, which can be because of noise or, or the actual physical structures and cable arrays. So what is displacement? It simply means that there are animals that avoid the area. So that's a question. Will species avoid the area because of these challenges? And then will that then push them into another area of risk? For example, will whales avoid this area and be pushed into a location with higher vessel traffic? Which brings us to the next threat, which is ship strike. Another big concern for recovering whale populations on the California coast. And as many of you know from ADC's other work, we've been, we've been working on minimizing the risk of ship strike, which is when large vessels hit and kill whales. So, that, so the ship strike risk can, become, can come from displacement, but it also can come from just the normal maintenance and monitoring activities of the projects themselves. There'll be vessels going to and from the ports to the project locations, and we need to ensure that they're going at proper speeds to avoid hitting whales. Um, next, we have habitat issues. And this is really simply that the fact that these projects may physically impact the habitat that they are over. So we want to ensure that this, that siting avoids important habitats such as deep sea corals or seamounts and many others. But as you can imagine, these large anchor chains are not just going to stay put in the ocean column they, or in the water column they're gonna be moving around and likely scouring the seafloor. So we wanna make sure that they're sited appropriately to avoid habitat destruction. And then finally, one of the issues we don't often hear about is what these projects will look like for nearby communities on shore. They're large industrial projects and the turbines are, are, as I mentioned, are so big that they're going to need to be constructed near where the wind farm is going to end up. They're too big to be transported on land. So this means that they need to be constructed at large ports that already have the capacity for such projects, or we need new facilities that need to be built on shore to complete the construction. This can have impacts on coastal ecosystems, but it may also change the character of coastal towns that agree to host such development. And we know some towns are looking forward to this and others may not quite be aware of what, what they're looking for when um, offshore wind comes to their area. Okay, so now I can shift to proposed areas of development where we're actually talking about potential offshore wind. So this photo or this image rather is of the Morro Bay area. So you see two polygons here, two blue areas. One, one is labeled as Morro Bay and the other as Diablo Canyon. And this is directly west of uh, San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay. So the top one, the Morro Bay polygon borders the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and it actually overlaps with the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And it is our understanding that the Northern Chumash Tribal Council who were the nominating body for that sanctuary are generally supportive of offshore wind. And, but we have to maintain the understanding that this is a really important area to the Chumash people. And as we've been very um, started, uh, supporters of their National Marine Sanctuary nominate, nomination, we will also continue our efforts to make sure that they are listened to as vital stakeholders because this is really important, important sea, sea space. Um, so when we're talking about these two areas, conversations started in 2016 when a wind company requested to lease the area off the coast of Morro Bay. So basically when any private company wants to use public land or sea space for a private project, they have to get a lease from the government. So when this company requested a lease, this started a process at the federal level to identify suitable sea space for offshore wind. And the federal agency in charge of that is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And in response to that lease request, the agency sent out what is called a call for competitive interest, or in simple terms, they asked other wind companies to speak up if they were also interested in leasing sea space for offshore wind. Multiple companies said they were interested, and that led to a process where the Bureau created call areas or places they thought may be optimal for offshore wind. So that's what you see here. The two areas are the two call areas on the central coast. There's also one up near Humboldt. So since the map was created, a task force of state and federal agencies have been in negotiations, and we understand that that, that has led to the Diablo Canyon area being removed from consideration due to concerns that it interferes with Department of Defense activities. So that's why I've circled the Morro Bay call area with orange. 
Um, it is the most likely place we will see offshore wind, though that area may shift a little bit with negotiations. And what, from what we've heard, this is also likely the only place along the central coast or Southern California for a federal wind project or a wind project in federal waters in the near future. And we expect to find out more about that final call area pretty soon, maybe in the next few weeks. Okay, so this picture, which is also my virtual background right now, is a rendering from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management of what the visibility of these turbines might actually be from shore. And this is a point east of the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse. Of course, the scale at which you are looking at this matters. So um, keep that in mind if you're looking at this on a tablet or a laptop or even your phone, you probably can't see anything. These renderings were designed to be printed at, at scale to show at community of events in person and not at a computer. So obviously the pandemic had other plans for in-person um, discussions about such things. So this is what we have to work with. But the main point is that the turbines will be visible on a clear day. And I've circled one again with an orange circle, which for your reference, if you can't really see it on your device, it appears to be about a third of the size of the lighthouse there in the background. And because EDC is focused on the environmental impacts I just discussed, I will leave it to you as the individual viewer to decide if these are obtrusive structures and a blight on the horizon or beautiful reminders of all that we're doing to tackle the climate crisis. And we will leave it at that for now. So that brings us to the projects in state waters. Yep. There are two projects off the coast between Vandenberg Air Force Base and Point Conception. We often refer to this as Point Conception area just because it's a really good reference point for people, but the point there is actually Point Arguello. They are in state waters or within about three miles of the coast. So I have two arrows here that just point to two distinct projects, which are each, each proposed to have four wind turbines. So the early stages of, or that we're, we're in the early stages of permitting and the State Lands Commission has a is the responsible state agency. They've uh, received these permit requests and they're in the pre sequa phase in which they're currently doing stakeholder outreach and data collection. So, um, and I realize that some of you might not even know where Vandenberg or Point Conception is. So this is west of Santa Barbara, south of San Luis Obispo, the nearest town is Lompoc. Um, okay, so, so they're in the early stages of data collection, stakeholder outreach. What does that mean for us as a community? Um, EDC and our coalition of partnering environmental groups that are work, working on offshore wind, and this includes NRDC and Audubon, as I mentioned already, Center for Biological Diversity and some others, we're all concerned about these projects because they are very close to shore. And the projects we were talking about potentially being up near Morro Bay are 20 plus miles from the shore, and here we're within three miles. And when you get to that in that space, you have a lot of species in the area that have near shore affinity or like to be close to shore and you're gonna have greater impacts to those species. This area has special designations, such as an, being an important bird areas for many species, such as sooty shearwater. And then there's also critical habitat for many species, such as humpback whale and leatherback sea turtles. And it's also a biologically important area for blue and gray whales. And these are just some of the special designations in this area. And those designations may overlap with offshore wind no matter where we put them, but we really wanna minimize the impacts to these special areas as much as possible. Okay, so moving forward, what is what, it, what are we doing moving forward? We are working really hard, we EDC and our partners are working really hard to push for a statewide planning process that first identifies the optimal locations for offshore wind and then considers how to move forward as opposed to constantly responding to industry requests for projects and locations that may be really problematic. We believe that planning can result in benefits to both industry and the environment. We are moving forward in good faith with the understanding that we are on the same side as industry with the goal to advance offshore wind. If we are responding to poorly cited projects and fighting bad projects, we will waste valuable time and energy that will slow the transition to renewables, which is why we think planning is so important. It, Seems like it will slow things down, but it actually will help make things more efficient. So we support recommendations that came out of a joint agency report on how to best get to 100% renewables, which is the quote you see there. And basically it says that planning can lead to address barriers to development, improve agency coordination. There's a lot of agencies that need to have a hand in this. It'll increase transparency and multi-stakeholder input. 
and it'll increase collaboration, including between environmental groups and the industry, and it'll avoid environmental impacts. And finally, it will move us to 100% renewables in the most efficient manner, which is pretty much all of our goals at this point. Okay, so I will leave you just with the, the fact that California's coastline is beloved for so many reasons that we all know, and they have to do with the beauty of our coastline, the richness of our marine ecosystem, and our abundant coastal dependent tourism opportunities. And we recognize that we need to transition to renewable energy, but we also want to, um, want to recognize that communities in the Santa Barbara Channel region in Southern California have already borne significant impacts from offshore oil development, and we want to ensure that offshore wind projects provide us with the opportunity to rely on renewable clean energy without devastating environmental consequences. And so we're really working hard to accomplish that. And with that, I will close up the presentation part of this webinar and pass it over to Betsy for some Q&A with you all. Thank you, Kristen. That was wonderful. Um, and again, as Kristen mentioned in the beginning, we were really given a high level overview here. Um, we definitely, as we learn more about the federal process and these specific projects, um, there will be more opportunities. So if you'd like to hear more on this topic uh, in future webinars, please do email us, let us know, um, and we will try to build that into the schedule. Um, I'm just gonna run through some of these questions that have been coming in here and feel free to add more. Um, We'll go through them for a while here and, and can follow up by email if we don't happen to get to yours. Um, so I guess first off is, uh, will there be wind farms in the Santa Barbara Channel right here? Oh yeah, that's such a great question. And before I answer, I will, I will mention, I forgot to say that my email is on this slide. For those of you who may just be listening, I know that's possible. You can find my email on our website. It's really easy, but it's khislop at environmentaldefensecenter.org. And I'm happy to converse with anyone uh, about this topic. Like I said, it's very fun and interesting. Um, so will offshore wind come to the Santa Barbara Channel? What I can say about that right now is that there's no proposals for the channel. Um, if we're looking at areas with, that have really high wind potential and lower environmental impacts, I can't imagine that the Santa Barbara Channel would um, align on either of those things. There's better wind um, further offshore and up further up the coast as you go north, it, it tends to get stronger, um, though there is some very strong wind potential off the point, off point conception, um, which is one of the reasons there's a project there. So I, I really don't see it happening in the near future. That doesn't mean that there won't be proposals, as I mentioned. Um, and I also, this reminded me, there's one other really interesting thing to note about why there were projects proposed off Morro Bay. And that's because there's already transmission potential at the power plants there that are being decommissioned or, or shutting down. So there's the Diablo Canyon power plant and the Morro Bay power plant. So there's already this infrastructure to actually bring that energy from offshore uh, to people's houses. Thanks, Kristen. Um, this next one you touched on briefly, but there's some more questioning on why um, the model of the cable fastening, as opposed to just having like stronger, sturdier poles, um, is the preferred model in off of our coast here. Uh, that is very simply the depth. So as you can imagine, having a structure that is 3,000 feet tall, as opposed to having um, this sort of cable connection, uh, is much more feasible. I don't even know if there is technology for that deep for offshore wind, maybe for other um, projects, but it's probably going to be cheaper, more efficient. Um, it may have less impacts. I, we don't know yet. There's, as I mentioned, there's a lot of questions about what the impacts of floating wind will be, but you don't have that pile driving, as I mentioned. Um, there's, they're also um, kind of being sold as non-permanent structures, though I, that will be, yet, that will be seen as we move forward. It's not like you can just plop these up and move them if you decide that's not the best location. So it's not that they're not permanent, just maybe less permanent than those really um, embedded structures. Okay, I'm gonna ask a, a few more kind of around the, the specifics on these turbines. Um, they're okay. wondering uh, what the area around them looks like, if that's specifically blocked off to other ocean um, users and how that, that works. Yes, that's a great question. So um, all of these projects are, are still being developed. So we don't know exactly 
the parameters of each one. The distance between each turbine is going to depend on the size they end up being. So as you can imagine, the bigger they are, the more space they need around them, um, not only for um, spacing of the cables and everything, but actually being able to harness the wind. If you put them too close together, they don't get their maximum potential um, for cost, essentially. So it depends on how big these, these areas are, but one example, one estimate is that they may be a kilometer, even a mile apart. So each, or not apart, each one would have a square kilometer around them. And then whether or not user groups can use the area is to be seen. I know that some recreational fishermen are really interested in, in these um, areas because they may actually act as fish aggregators. So fish might be attracted to, to hanging out around the cables or the actual turbine structure underwater. And so fishermen might wanna go and, and fish these areas. Uh, we haven't heard from industry if that's a feasible outcome or not. So that's just a big question. These may be accessible or they may be areas that are just closed entirely to other users. Um, as you know, sometimes around the oil platforms, for example, you can't get too close even if you want to. So that is to be, yet to be seen. Great. Um, another question here on when we're referencing this coming into the onshore infrastructure, what exactly does that look like? How does, how does that work? Yeah, so that's um, another issue that I feel like we haven't had as many discussions about the impacts. So the onshore infrastructure, as you can imagine, these, these turbine blades, if they're 100 meters, you can't just um, truck them down the street and move them from place to place on land. So you're going to need a, a very robust onshore facility to actually create these, to build them. And then you need to, to essentially um, barge them out, ship them out to the location they're gonna end up. And that's gonna, potentially you could do that say from the port of Long Beach, if you're, if you're willing to bring them all the way up here without the negative impacts of shipping themselves, or in some areas, they're talking about actually improving the infrastructure there. So we aren't working in Humble. I don't know all the details of it, but I've heard that the community is actually very excited about their, um, port or harbor area uh, having some influx of, of money to be improved, though I'm curious to see what the improvements end up looking like. These, these are going to be very big structures um, and are going to require quite a bit of onshore infrastructure to do that. So it's definitely going to change the character of the, the harbors or the ports or the, the towns. Thank you. Um, and there's uh, it's another question here on um, once these are in place, who would be responsible for any potential entanglements to wildlife or anything like that that happens? Who does that responsibility <clears throat> fall on for that? And the similar question is um, for a uh, monitoring that might to take place. Um, again, who is responsible for that and how does that happen? Yeah, so a lot of these questions um, boil down to the issue we're really focused on, which is planning. So uh, I want to give an example. Um, there's a few projects in Europe that we would love to be getting information on so that we could have increased data to help us make better decisions over here. And the, the governments there didn't require the same level of monitoring that we would um, hope to see here. So we're not actually getting the data on, say, collision risk or entanglement risk with these floating turbines because they didn't require that, that as a piece of their permitting process. And in California, you know, we, ha we do have quite robust permitting. Um, of course, some of these are offshore in federal waters. So it's the, the two different permitting processes are different. But what we hope is that the industry, so the companies that are actually benefiting from this resource are going to be responsible for monitoring, which means having the ability to see how many birds are being struck by these or are colliding with these turbines um, and, and having some kind of monitoring for the cables so that we know if things are being entangled. And we've heard from industry that there are options for, for consistent monitoring with that um, so that they're aware when entanglements happen and we can actually quantify the impact of that. And so again, it depends on what the planning process and the permitting entails but hopefully it's robust in which the responsible party to mitigate for any issues is the, um, the industry or the company itself that is benefiting from 
using the wind resource and getting it to people's homes. Great. Um, how feasible is it to have state uh, requirements or recommendations? Um, I, I think this question is just addressing on the state versus federal projects um, and feasibility on requirements and, and guidelines for that. Yeah, so um, a little more in depth and it's a great question. If these projects are in federal waters, they are uh, under federal permitting requirements. Though the, the caveat to that is that there is going to be a need for the transmission to go through state waters and all of the onshore infrastructure will be under state uh, regulations. So that gives us some capability of really maintaining the, um, the statewide strong environmental laws. But in, in federal waters, there's just federal consistency with state, um, with state regulations. So we have a little less uh, ability to use the, the strong California environmental laws in that realm. Um, do we need offshore wind to meet California's energy goals? This is a great question and one that is another reason we really want a statewide planning process. Um, this is one that we've been asking. We know that we need renewable energy and we know that all energy, as I mentioned, is gonna have impact. So we don't wanna just throw solar panels in the desert and decimate desert species and populations. And we know that we don't wanna be NIMBY, not in my backyard, um, saying we just wanna put it somewhere where we don't have to think about it, but benefit from it. So, but at the same time, we know that offshore wind is gonna have environmental impacts. And we wanna make sure that it is a really a serious requirement for the state of California. And there's many different ways of modeling uh, renewable energy for the state that do or do not include offshore wind. But I will say, if we don't have offshore wind, we're gonna more heavily rely on solar and battery storage, which both have their own impacts too. So um, from, what we've, from what we've learned throughout this process is we can get a lot of benefit from relatively small amount of space with offshore wind as opposed to say solar projects. Great. Um, and a question that's come in a number of times here is just if you can give any more on the timeline of these projects, um, both in, in the kind of the process, but also like how far out would we be before these projects would actually bear fruit? Um, and also there's a lot of interest on what the community can do right now, if there's any potential way they can help or weigh in. That's great. Um, so when we started this in 2016, we were expecting that these call areas would be decided upon within the year. And as with almost all of our work, it's really hard to predict how long these processes will take. Here we are five years later, almost um, kind of in the same spot we were in 2016. We've been pushing for planning to happen during this whole time. We could have had a planning process complete had the, had you know the the agency stepped up to do it or the budgeting be allocated so that they could. I don't want to put all of the responsibility on the agencies. Um, so it's it's a big question mark as to how fast we can get this done. There are really aggressive goals in the state legislature right now to get energy online by 2030. Um, we think that that is probably pretty aggressive considering we don't even have lease space yet. But that being said, the wind industry believes they can get these online relatively quickly. Um, I can't imagine that we would see them in the water within say five years, but within 10 years, that's a very likely potential, depending again on how quickly the permitting process goes, how quickly the planning gets underway. Um, when BOEM or Bureau of Ocean Energy Management comes out with their final lease areas, um, we do expect things to move more quickly now that we have a new federal administration. Things were completely paused under the Trump administration. They had it, they had no interest in forwarding offshore wind. And the Biden administration has made some serious goals to support wind in, in the United States. Whether or not that will include California is to be seen. A lot of the energy is in on the East Coast. But we have been seeing a lot of energy in the legislature of California to push forth with offshore wind. So that's a very vague answer to your questions, which is that we don't know, but very likely we could see this within the next decade. Um, and what was the second part of that question, Betsy? 
um, how people can help if there's a way that they can weigh in right now. Yeah, of course. So as I mentioned, uh, it seems like the call areas for the federal space, so the Morro Bay area, will come out soon. We don't know. No one's told us for sure, but we've heard that these may be released in the next month or so. And then um, from there, there will be a public comment opportunity. So that's always a great time for people to, to voice um, what their concerns or support or data they understand to be helpful. And then with the state water projects, as I mentioned, they're in the early, the pre sequa phase, meaning the pre planning phase. And they're basically accepting information about uh, they're asking for data in the area that can help them with their what's called a preliminary environmental assessment. After that's complete, which we expect that to be done this summer, then they will essentially take these projects to the commission to either move forward or um, be stopped because they don't feel they're in the best interest of the state. And at that time, there may be another opportunity for public comment. So uh, as we mentioned earlier in this webinar, this is a very high level. We did get into specific projects, but not necessarily the details of how we can all help because there's nothing at this moment, but that could change rapidly. We could end up sending you all an action alert next week saying, hey, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management just released these call areas. We need your thoughts, um, send them in. So keep your eye out for that. And uh, as Betsy and I both mentioned, maybe we'll get another webinar going with information, more specific information of how you can get involved. Thanks, Kristen. We're going to wrap up here. I, I just wanted to thank Kristen for all her time and this wonderful presentation and also our office manager, Danny, who helped us coordinate everything on the back end. Um, and yeah, feel free to email questions. There was a number that we didn't get to that were a little more in depth, um, so we can do our best to answer those in the coming days. Um, and we will send out a recording to everyone of this webinar for you to reference or share with anyone um, within the week. Um, and yeah, just thank you all for taking your lunch hour to join us. Um, I hope it was helpful information. Yes, thank you. I just want to reiterate, I see a lot of questions we weren't able to get to as we, as we mentioned, we're trying to keep this short. So please, please do feel um, free to reach out. I'm always happy to, to field questions and, and talk about this issue. So thank you very much for your time.